The following KQED production was produced in high definition. On January 25, 2008, during a week of intense winter rainstorms, nearly two and a half million gallons of raw sewage poured into San Francisco Bay from a wastewater treatment plant in Mill Valley. Six days later, after a worker failed to set up enough pumps, there was another spill of partially treated sewage at the same location. By the time the rains had stopped, more than three million gallons of raw or partially treated sewage had fouled the bay, closing beaches for nearly a week and posing a serious health risk to any living thing that touched it. When sewage spills happen, what's usually contained in those spills are a host of pathogens, bacteria, and viruses that come from our fecal matter when we flush our toilets. And when that gets into the water, it can deplete oxygen in an enclosed area. It can also cause algal blooms by the inflow of phosphorus and nitrates. And by putting those kinds of things in the water, you're basically not allowing the water to breathe. You're not allowing ecosystem balance to exist. And when windsurfers, swimmers, fishermen, and others come into contact with water contaminated with sewage, it can cause persistent skin infections and painful stomach disorders. The Marin spill wasn't an isolated incident. From 2003 to 2006, Richmond spilled more than a million gallons, and South San Francisco spilled nearly two million gallons. Dozens of other cities have had similar incidents over the past decade. Sejal Choksi is the program director of San Francisco Baykeeper, an environmental group that's working to fix the problem. Baykeeper has been fighting a sewage campaign for about a decade now. But a few years ago, we started seeing more and more spills, and that's because the, the age of the pipes is just getting older. So we're, we're going to continue to see a problem of sewage spills unless we get our cities to prioritize fixing their systems. The Bay Area's first sewers were built in the 1880s and consisted of wooden, brick, and clay pipes that dumped human waste directly into the Bay. In the 1950s, wastewater plants were built to process raw sewage, but treatment was minimal without disinfection before the filtered wastewater was released into the Bay. Almost three, four decades ago, the San Francisco Bay was so contaminated with sewage that it was just a cesspool. People would walk near it and just smell this overwhelming stink of raw sewage. That's really one of the things that led to the Federal Clean Water Act. The Clean Water Act, a landmark environmental law passed by Congress in 1972, required all wastewater to meet certain standards before being discharged into bays, rivers, or the ocean. Bruce Wolf is the executive officer of the San Francisco Bay Regional Water Quality Control Board, the main state agency that works with the EPA to enforce the Clean Water Act in the Bay Area. The scale of the job is enormous. On a daily basis, there's about 500 million gallons of treated wastewater that's discharged to the San Francisco Bay. That's in full compliance with our permits. Every time one of the 7 million Bay Area residents flushes a toilet, roughly 12 hours later, the water that leaves their home passes through a sewage plant and ends up in the Bay. I think people don't really know where their wastewater goes and what happens when they flush their toilets, mainly because all of the pipes are underground. Uh, it's basically an out of sight, out of mind type of issue. Let's just lift the Someone who makes a business out of knowing exactly what happens after you flush your toilet is Doug Humphrey. He's responsible for the safe collection and conveyance of raw sewage in Contra Costa County's Steed Sanitary District. When someone flushes a toilet or runs bath water or your sink or your washer at home. Uh, all the wastewater is conveyed through an underground pipe system to a wastewater treatment plant. Sewage from Humphreys District and six other East Bay cities ends up at the East Bay Municipal Utility District's wastewater treatment facility in Oakland. Here, Dave Williams directs the stinky but critically important process of disinfecting the sewage using methods that are surprisingly low-tech. 
I think probably the most important thing to consider about a wastewater treatment plant that utilizes secondary treatment is that it utilizes nature's own way of purifying water. But we just do it in a much more concentrated footprint and we also put in power and mechanical equipment to help it uh, get done in a very short period of time. Here's what happens at the facility and most of the other 46 sewage treatment plants around the bay. First, all the garbage is removed. Then the wastewater is put in open tanks where gravity causes some solids to settle to the bottom while others float to the top. These biosolids are removed. Some are processed to be used as fertilizer and the rest are disposed of in landfills. That's called primary treatment. Next comes secondary treatment, a biological process where colonies of bacteria consume organic matter in the wastewater. The bacteria are settled out so that the water is clear and free of organic waste. The resulting effluent is disinfected with bleach, dechlorinated, and discharged into the bay from one of 35 different locations. In general, the wastewater treatment plants tend to operate as they were created to operate. But the thing is that our population growth has been so strong in the Bay Area that a lot of these treatment plants that were built 20, 30 years ago no longer can handle the capacity of the flow that's coming in. And because of the problems with the collection system pipes, there's a lot of rainwater that's now being allowed to infiltrate into the treatment plant. And that just means that there's excess water and when the treatment plant can't handle that water, they're allowed to legally discharge it. And that's why so many sewage spills happen during heavy rainstorms. Many of the 17,000 miles of sewer pipes that snake under Bay Area streets are more than 80 years old and made of clay. Over time, tree roots, earthquakes, and other factors have cracked and loosened these brittle old pipes, allowing a huge amount of water to seep into them during wet weather. And it's this combination of sewage and unintended rainwater that can overwhelm the treatment plants downstream, causing spills. We can get up to 10 to 15 times the amount of flow in these pipes in wet weather as opposed to what we get in a dry weather situation when it's summertime. It's not just the city's problem. Every single home and business has a pipe that connects it to the city's sewage mains, known as laterals. These pipes are the responsibility of property owners to maintain, and often they don't. Those private lateral lines are also similar to ours in that they were constructed at the same time and of the same material. And sometimes, uh, in general, they're actually even in worse condition than our lines are. So there's a need for replacement of the lateral lines as well as our main lines. So the combination of crumbling lateral pipes, cracked sewage mains, aging treatment plants, and stormwater is a recipe for big spills each winter. So what's the solution? We asked Stephen Danahy, who runs the sewerage agency of Southern Marin in Mill Valley, which spilled millions of gallons of sewage into the bay in 2008. The January 25th overflow was an overflow from our equalization ponds um, due to the high flows coming into the plant. Repairing sewer lines is, is, a, is a huge plus to reducing the amount of excess water that gets into the system, especially in the winter months when it's raining. Either reduce it outside the system at the source, if you can, or increase your plant capacity to a point where you can handle everything that comes down the pipe. I don't know how realistic that is. Historically, the maintenance and the upgrade of sewage collection systems has really fallen behind because the decision makers frequently say we need to keep rates low. And of course, these pipes are sort of out of sight, out of mind, and it only becomes an issue when there's a spill or an overflow. And we do enforce against these, including using fines to make sure that the decision makers are paying attention to this. Do the fines make a difference? Well, presumably, the $1.6 million fine that the Regional Water Board slapped on the Mill Valley plant did get the attention of the Bay Area's other wastewater treatment plants. But Baykeeper and other environmental groups feel that much more is needed if we want to keep the Bay from becoming a giant toilet again. What a lot of people don't know is that a lot of the treatment plants and the collection systems have permits to discharge. So according to the regulatory agency, 
under the law, they're currently allowed to discharge as much as they want to or uh, up to a certain limit. We're looking at whether the permits are stringent enough and are going to keep pollution out of the bay and are going to protect our natural resources. The use of new technology for inspecting, clearing, and repairing underground pipes is the first step toward slowly modernizing the system. But replacing all of the Bay Area's old sewer pipes with new watertight systems could cost $10 billion or more. Some funding is available from Washington, D.C., particularly from the federal stimulus bill. But it's not enough to complete the whole job. It's a challenge to keep our streets and bridges upgraded when we can see those on a daily basis. It's even more of a challenge to keep our sewage collection system, our stormwater collection system, our wastewater treatment system upgraded where it's typically things that we don't see. We need to move forward and start work on that and we can't just say it, it can't be done perfectly so we shouldn't do it all. We need to be making more progress than we have been making.